We're turning to Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. That's where we'll be at um, this morning. Um, we're starting a new sermon series entitled In His Image. And um, for the next three weeks, we're actually going to be really focusing on, on two verses. And you're like, how are we about to really spend three weeks and two verses? Well, watch us. Um, <laughs> but I think these are, are two rich verses that the Lord wants us to understand who we are. And it's integral to us seeing um, who we are in light of um, how he's created us to be. And I think we're going to move forward in this trajectory of understanding that reality from these words from the Lord in Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 27. Here's what the word of the Lord says. It reads as this. Then God said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, and in the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Praise be to God for the reading of his word. You guys can have a seat. Let me ask the Lord to help us this morning. Father, help us. Help us to see the richness of your word. Help us to seek to live our lives in accordance to your word and the the truths that you say about who we are. In a world filled with distractions, things that can cause us to linger about different images even of ourselves, we can be replenished through your word, reminded of who we truly are. Father, in these moments, I ask you to help us to to see Jesus clearly through your word, to see our need for him and that we would run quickly to the cross and find our hope, our boast in the cross and cross alone. Be gracious to us, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I want to tag the text for our exchange this morning. Divinely created, priceless in worth. Divinely created, priceless in worth. In 2018, John Franklin Stevens, an effective and poignant communicator with Down syndrome, sat before the United Nations and made a powerful and a compelling case that his life was worth living. He proceeded to share that he was uniquely formed with more chromosomes than the average person. Mr. Stevens continued by depicting that physically there are differences between those who do and do not have Down syndrome. But in his opening words, he made an explicit case. He said, I am a man. I am a man. He resumed to continue to say that, see me as a human being, not a birth defect, not a syndrome. I don't need to be eradicated. I need to be, I don't need to be cured. I need to be loved, valued, educated, and sometimes helped. Mr. Stevens, whether he realized it or not, was making a case for the value and worth of his life. He communicated that he was intentionally created and that he was priceless in worth, even in a society who did not see him as that. He's saying, I am a man. I have this same value and worth that you guys have. So, Allow me to live. Our sermon text this morning echoes the words of Mr. Stevens and brings a a deeper meaning to his moral case. We are divinely created, priceless, and worth. At times, even in your own life, maybe you felt like you are not as valued As another person's life. Maybe you resonate somewhat with Mr. Stevens' words, maybe not to the extent of himself, but you you felt that before. Maybe it's in a group of friends. Maybe it's in a a space that you, you walk into. You don't feel like you are as valued as someone else. Well, I've been sent this morning to tell you, to remind you, that could be one of the greatest lies that you could ever believe about yourself. But if you're honest, it might happen more often than you like to admit. When you're away, isolated, and 
kind of in your own mind, you can tend to wonder and believe lies about yourself. But our text challenges that. See, our passage builds a monumental foundation to our identity as humans, and it shares the intentionality in God's hand in forming you. This passage finds itself located early on in the creative narrative. What we see happening is this, the triune God created the heavens and the earth in six days, and on the seventh day he rests. Yes, I say, yes, the the Father, the Son, and the Spirit intentionally designed the heavens and the earth to reflect their glory. And on the sixth day, they uniquely created humanity. Prior to creating mankind, God created all the animals, but they did not peril to the finest creation. That might be something for us to reflect on because we're in a space where that's kind of changing, not in a good direction, but... I won't labor on that moment, but he deems all of creation good, but declares that his creation to be very good after mankind comes into the picture. It's God and his creative act that that specifies that humanity, you and I, are made in his image and likeness. But do we know what that really means? And we talk about it a lot. We Oh, yeah, we're made in the image of God. We got worth. Yeah, it's cool, cool. But do, have we really waded in these waters to be able to, to stand firm and to declare who we are because of God? This leads us to our first observation. We are divinely created. Divinely created. Genesis' depiction of the origin of humanity says, Then God said, Let's pause for a moment and reflect. You might... You might think, well, those are just some very simple words. Then God uh, said. These words are critical even to our understanding of what it means to be human. Why would that be the case? Well, God initiates. The Latin term ex nihilo means out of nothing, all of his creation. And so what we see here is that this is crucial to our understanding, of understanding God's intentional design and engagement with the world. Because God is an active agent, which is expressed in his creative hands, his relational nature, and his sovereign hand. The reality of then God said proves God's activity in engaging, even his creation. God moved towards, he created, he made. In other words, God took special interest in the creation of humanity. In a similar manner to as he did for the rest of the world. He literally spoke it into existence. See, this proves the infinite power of God to create us out of nothing. It wasn't like he took the trees and made Adam. No, no, no. He, he, he created him out of nothing. See, I don't know if you have realized this yet or not, but we can't do that. People have been trying to. They've been trying to do everything they can to replicate the creation of human, humanity, but we can't. See, there's nothing in human history that can be created out of nothing. There is no process, technology, or innovation that can claim grounds for the creation of humanity. We've been divinely created, and there's nothing like us. That's helpful for us to remember. See, typically when a new piece of technology comes out, there's some sense of a comparative technology that inspires and challenges the product to be created. For example, maybe if you are someone that was trying to get one of the the PlayStation 5s or the new Xboxes, they were made in comparison to one another. And if you're trying to go for those, you will understand that any time a new PlayStation or Xbox comes out, they are attempting to outdo one another. Maybe if you're not a gamer, another example would be the Android and Apple market. I've already specified before which one is superior. So, okay, Apple is Okay, there it is. But, but here's the point. Anytime you see a new Apple iPhone comes out, you see a new Samsung come out. There, there's a point in that. They're competing. But out of all of God's creation, nothing compares to the creation of humanity. Nothing. There is no comparative design. It wasn't like there was oh, something really close. Out of nothing, he created humanity. But it's interesting, though. 
because Scripture details the ascending order in creation story, which proves that humanity is even the pinnacle of creation. He, he's building the case to get to us. Therefore, the only proper and just comparison is God himself. Not that we are God, but he made us in his image. We're the closest thing that here on earth that can reflect God. See, the text says, let us make man in our own, in our image and after our likeness. And we see our text says, let us. Those words, again, might seem minuscule to us, but they have immense weight. What they're seeking to help us understand is that the triune God was active and present in creation. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit were present in activity in this creative narrative. Engaging, forming, even helps us understand who Jesus is. Because this leads us to believe that Jesus was not an afterthought when it came to the image of God. See, we were created in the image of the triune God. Supposed to represent God here on earth. See, our passage says we are made in his image. and Meaning we as humans reflect God. We were created as representatives of God on earth. We are his vice regents and who have the opportunity to represent him in all that we do, everything. See, no matter who you are or, or where, you, where you're from or what is your so-called calling in your life, you were created to reflect God and to make his glory known throughout the world. Have you been seeking to live in that way? So you were divinely created with a purpose, and that purpose can never be taken away from you. But it's interesting here because many of us live lives that we are searching for that purpose. What is my true purpose in life? This is why this matters that we're divinely created, because the purpose has been given to you to reflect God and live for his glory. And we find that in this text. So although people would be determined to tell us that we have a different purpose in this life, even though it might not come out in an explicit or blatant way, even though everything around us seeks to define and alter or influence your purpose in life, God has given you a purpose that should define our present and that should define our future. We are divinely created. And God has given us a rich, unique, and valuable purpose in this world. So why are we so determined to find the greater purpose? Why can't we rest in who God has created us to be and seek to reflect him? See, it's this idea that reminds us of sin's interest into the world and how sin has impacted us. We don't find that purpose enough. We want to gain more. Thinking about Adam and Eve in the garden. Going for the fruit, it was a desire to find more. Reflecting God, living for his glory wasn't enough. That's why it matters that we remind ourselves that we've been divinely created for a purpose and, and called to be here and to dwell here for a reason. But also our purpose is going to remind us that we have dignity and worth. Friends, we have dignity and worth. We've been made in God's image and likeness, and our dignity and worth comes from him. Think about that. It comes from him. Not just because we are human, not just because we dwell here, but it comes from our creator. There's a difference. There has to be a foundation for, if we say that people matter, it has to come from somewhere. See, we live in a world where we feel the pressure to be defined by maybe the views of our friends. You've maybe experienced that before. Maybe your family. Maybe even your coworkers. You felt the weight of that. Leaving a conversation, leaving extended time together with others, and you, you feel like your dignity and worth might be defined by them. Maybe it's how media attempts to Tell us how to value life. Or for some, it might be social media that tricks people into believing lies about who is the most valuable people in the world. Yet God says, let us make man in our 
image, his image. Can people who are made in God's image truly be devalued? Can can they really? Well, no. Because their worth and dignity come from God. Now, many of y'all, even as I said that, you're like, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. I mean, they can't. I've seen it happen all around me. But this is something that's key for us to understand in this text. See, many will respond and say, yes, but we cannot take away worth and dignity from someone when it was never ours to begin with. Hear me say that one more time. We can never take away dignity and worth from someone when it was never ours to begin with. You're giving them the value for the dignity and worth that God has given you. Someone can't strip that away from you. So, yes, you can try to devalue someone, but there is no way possible to take away the image that has been imputed to them. Let me tease that out a little bit. We can try to denigrate. We can try to demoralize. We can try to dehumanize. But our words, our actions, our cultural norms cannot remove the worth and value given by God. That matters. Why does that matter? Because as we dwell in spaces that we are in, there might be times where you do not feel valued, you do not feel worthy, you do not feel um, cared for. Who is giving you those things? God. Someone else does not have the power to take that away from you. But we live in a culture where we give people the power that's only God's. And see, that's what leads us to these spaces where we do feel denigrated, demoralized, and dehumanized in those moments. God has created you in this way. Those people didn't. And it's very, very helpful for us to remember that. And friends, this, is, this might be liberating for someone because no matter what they've said about you, no matter about if it was 10 years ago and it was one of those, those conversations that just set you astray for a while, no matter what they've done to you, whether people haven't cared for you well, if they have not thought about your interests, if they have not sought to, to pursue you in relationship, whether, they, whether or not they have, have done wrong things to you, it doesn't change it. It doesn't matter if things have been implied through conversation. That cannot change whom God has created you to be, and no one can take away your worth. Friends, don't buy into the lie. Don't give them the power and the authority to believe that they can take away something so intrinsic away from you. See, what we've done is we've flipped over, upside down, the creator-creature distinction. We've given power to the creature over the creator. And And that's why it's hard for some of us to walk in freedom as we remind ourselves of whom God has created us to be. Because you give more power to them. that You act like they can take it away from you. They can't. See, whatever God defines about our lives, we need to re- realign ourselves with his truthfulness. God has spoken. It. It's a reality. This is who you are. He's created you this way. You've got to remember that. Because God defines a narrative and purpose for your life. No one else has that ability. Have you given someone the power to define your worth? Is it maybe a group of people? Maybe it's some norms? Or does your worth come from God himself? Is it a desire for you to to dive deeply into his word, to seek to know him, to to love him, for he can remind you of those truths of who you are? See, they might know they have power or realize the weight of their actions at times. These are the people. But we always have to remove them from the role that they need never deserved. And I don't know who that is in your life. Maybe it's your father. Maybe it's your mother. Maybe it's your boss. Maybe it's your spouse. And they can say a word and it cripples you to second guess every single thing about yourself. This is why it matters who God said you are. This is why it matters that you pursue relationships with people who are going to remind you of that, who's going to affirm that, who's going to encourage you in that direction. See, we have the tendency to value the insights, perspectives of our fellow image bearers more than God. We've misapplied this text. We have 
distance ourselves from centralizing the image of God to being more concerned about the image of self? How do I become like them? How does my self reflect them? Or how do I reflect the self, the image that I want to have instead of reflecting God? See, when we build ourselves in our own comprehension of what it means to be an imager, it will lead to destruction, not liberation. If you keep going for the magazines, you're trying to find the good life, what it means to be valued. And your definition of being a good image is that? Think about where that could get you. Let me give an example. When the image of self drives us to achieve self-sufficiency, we will go after anything and everything that projects a sense of self-confidence, dignity, worth, and purpose. I mean, you'll go after it. You want, you want that feeling within you. And you know it at times where, where others will see that you're good, you're, you're good on your own, you, you have your purpose, you have your value, you have your dignity. So, so anyone that you see that has a sense of a swagger, you want to be like them. But it's not you becoming like someone else. It's not you reflecting their image. But you're called to reflect God's image. In other words, when we root our image, which is our purpose and what we reflect in the experiences and presentations and values of others, we will always aimlessly be looking for self-sufficiency. Maybe that's what's driving you right now. You're going after that sense of self-sufficiency. But us being created in God's image means that you will never be self-sufficient. Because you are meant to reflect him. You, you can't do this on your own, but you're created to reflect God. There, there's a difference there. So maybe your whole aim in your life has been to, to build a life where you can do it all bad by yourself. You can do it by yourself. You're good. But you were never created in that way. You were meant to reflect God. And here's the truth. Your creator has uniquely and divinely created you, and he has empowered you with an indescribable, unchangeable worth and purpose. And you need to remind yourself that early and often. No matter what you see on an Instagram story, no matter what you see on a Facebook feed that might draw you in, no matter what your boss says, or maybe even your family's expressions of love that hit you the wrong way, none of those things can change your purpose. In your worth. Too many of us have been defined by the rumors. The rumors that you're still living with from 10 years ago. The, the stories that have been told. Where, where you just tense up even thinking about it right now. Some of y'all, y'all are running through the, the meal in your head right now. Th- those have shaped you. Those have defined you to believe lies about yourself. Maybe you've been defined by your own mistakes. The mistakes you made last week the mistakes you made three months ago or 15 years ago. You allow that to define your worth. and You believe the lie that you're not good enough. Friends, God has created you. He's made you in his image. He's the one who's given you value and purpose. It's not your mistakes that give you that. It's not the rumors that give you that. Maybe it's your fears. Maybe your fears have crippled you to even to walk forward in what God has for you. And it's your fear of failing, it's your, your fear of messing up, your fear of even reflecting God well in this world. And so you're, you're so crippled by that fear, maybe what other people will think about you. Fill in the blank. Maybe it's your future. Maybe it's the idea of who you want to become, what you envision as the good life. Oh, well, those people are better people. I want to be like them. None of those areas change who God has created you to be, friends. None of them. I remember being in high school, and a teacher said something to me that tempted me to allow it to define me. It was in an AP English class, and they said something along the lines, you will not be able to make it, or hack it in college English. Now, at that time, depending on who you are, that's a really big deal. 
That's a defining statement. Many people will not go to college over a statement like that. They will not access certain things in their lives. They will, depending on the space that you are in, you can allow something like that to imprint on you. At the time, I was college-bound, but those words that were said about me, about who I was or what I could become, could have been debilitating. And, and I give that example for, for a purpose, because many of us have went through stages of life, and we've had some things said about us that we've allowed to define us, and they're, they're continuing to define us. See, in those moments of life, when, when those words, or those phrases are said, you, you want to kind of go back into to, to your room, into your closet, and just say, okay, this is maybe who I am now. But when you know who God has created you to be, when you know who, who God has made you to be, you can move forward confidently knowing where your worth is found, knowing where your purpose is found, because someone cannot strip that away from you. See, I'm blessed to be surrounded by people that reminded me of that even in those moments. Because I was tempted to believe it. Like, oh, maybe, maybe I can. Well, three plus degrees later, I think I made it. I'm not saying I'm perfect. But, but it, it's a real deal, though. Because some of us are believing these lies right now about ourselves. And maybe it's not a lie that somebody's ever said out loud. Maybe it's a lie that you're telling yourself. Know your worth. Know your dignity. Not in a, a self-righteous type of way, but know it because of God. And remind yourself that. And walk forward confidently in who God has created you to be. You're divinely created, priceless, and worth. See, in those moments when you're tempted to believe the lie, it matters that you know your worth and dignity because that will ground you in all of life's greatest and lowest moments. And maybe right now you feel like you've got it all together, your swagger's straight, you know you're, you're moving forward in life. But the low and the high moments hit all of us. Whether you feel like you're failing as a father, feel like you're failing as a mother, you're failing to, even, to pursue even dating relationships, maybe you feel like you're, you're failing in all manners of life. None of those things define your dignity and worth. It comes from God. Friends, stop listening to the haters. Listen to God. Because God created you. God knows you. God formed you. And God cares for you. For those who are maybe skeptical of Christianity that might be listening to me right now, I want to ask you what undergirds the value of life for you. I mean, we talk about respecting and valuing and caring for humans. But, but what is our moral foundation and obligation? to the best solutions to affirm dignity in life. I mean, you, you all know, I mean, we've all been in our world in the past two years, and like everybody is trying to lay claims on who lives matter, but how do we know that life matters? See, God in his word has revealed to us his grand story, and it shares with us that all men and women are created in his image and are imaging God. And this is foundational to any conversation that we have in life because we are made in his image. And maybe you are hearing many groups talking about having the moral high ground to define or to determine whose lives matter the most. But here's the reality. God has spoken. All of humanity has value, dignity, and worth because we're made in his image. Yet how do we learn to reflect his image in this world? Maybe that's what you're trying to figure out. But maybe you're that skeptic. I just want to encourage you to remember, God has spoken in this in such a very intentional way to bring clarity to how he cares about humanity and how he has given us value, dignity, and worth. And that should shape the way we engage in any space. See, God is, is, is who gives us this strong foundation. Then our response is, though, well, how do we learn to reflect his image in this world? Where should we start? Where, where do we begin? So maybe you know the reality. Okay, I've been created divinely. You know you have worth and purpose. But now how are you supposed to live that out? Because there is a call to live this out, to reflect the mirror here on earth. How about Jesus? Oh, you probably expected me to say something like that. Friends, we know Jesus is our example. See, God perfectly created humanity in his image. But the fall led to the distortion of the Mago Dei, and humanity still bears the image in a broad sense. But the results of the fall 
marred the image in a narrow sense. Even though believers are made in the image of God, we are growing in what it means to image God. Listen to the clarity there. Even though believers are made in the image of God, we are growing in what it means to image God. So you can know your worth, you can know your purpose, you can know who you're created by, but you have to learn how to actually live in that manner. In other words, the image of God is a static and dynamic reality. It's a reality that's true, but also you're growing in how you reflect God well here on earth. So both are true realities. Everyone is an imager, but we have to reflect him well. We are all broadly imagers of God, but when someone encounters Jesus, encounters Jesus, the new self, the person who's been made new through Christ's death, burial, and resurrection, through trusting him in faith, that new person seeks to follow Jesus and catch a vision for what it means to actually be an imager. That could be the difference. Let me explain it this way. My son loves the play of anything and everything that he can get, get his hands on. And if you're a parent, you, you understand that reality. The catch is, he does not always play with the object or toys by using them for their intended purpose. For example, if you know me, I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of shoes. Well, Kai loves to play with shoes. He doesn't like to put them on his feet, though. He likes to carry them. He likes to try to put them in his mouth. He tries to put them on his hands and wear them. He doesn't use them for their intended purpose and finds random ways to improperly use them like all said above. Similarly, we know we are in the image of God, but we improperly reflect God as an imager. We distort what it means to image God by allowing our image to serve other purposes. Friends, how are you reflecting God? You might know this is a reality, but are you seeking to reflect him for all his good purposes in its intended means? Or are you trying to maneuver it however you want to for your own gain? See, before Jesus, we don't realize the weight of what it means to bear God's image. I really don't believe we do. I think in God's common grace, I think people understand that people matter. But this is why we have the the high ground per se of we know what God has actually said and we know the value that God has given to humanity. But until we come to know Jesus, we don't see what clarity, what it actually means to image God. See, the image of God seems ubiquitous to us and we don't know how to define it or who to look to for our definition. In our own minds, it would be easy for us even to believe that we are the true image of God. And even subconsciously at times, when you think about it and how you even care for others, you might think that you might be one of the best reflections of God. However, notice that the, the Bible says that we are made in the image. But what about Jesus? Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says that he is the image, the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Very intentional words there. He is the image. We're in the image, but Jesus is the image. Jesus is the true image of God. We are made in the image of God. Jesus is our example of what it looks like to image God on earth. He shows us that through the incarnation. He makes the invisible God visible and serves as the only perfect image of God. Therefore, for Humanity to properly image God, we must experience redemption through Christ, be transformed, renewed, and conformed. Let me tease that out for a moment. Second Corinthians chapter three, verse eighteen. And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree to of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So, so, so Jesus is the example, and we're being transformed, conforming into his image. Jesus is the prime example. There's nothing greater than Jesus. 
So the other temptations that bind to a different image, they don't compare to Jesus. He is the true image. And we want to reflect him. This text is helping us understand the, the process of sanctification. We are being transformed. So that is that more narrow element. We're going to reflect that in a dynamic way. Colossians chapter 3, verse 9 through 10. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. So remember this new self, old self conversation. And have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. image of his creator even in colossians 1 it's a really rich text if you go back and read that so that jesus was there in the beginning jesus is the one who spoke this into existence jesus is the firstborn it's the image of your creator this is why it matters that the trinitarian nature of understanding of let us matters in this text how about romans chapter 8 verse 29 for those whom he foreknew he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. Again, Jesus is the one whom we are being transformed, conformed into his image. In other words, we are created as imagers of God, but post-fall we place our identity outside of God's image and place it in ourselves, others, or creation. But in the New Testament, the image of, of language emerges and Christ restores and redeems and he rescues us from distortion And he enables us to properly reflect and represent the image of God here on earth. Jesus being the image changes everything. Our example of what it means to image God is found in Christ. Not athletes, not actors, not influencers. None of them can show us adequately how to image God. Jesus alone can do that. Our families do not set the bar, nor can they move the standards of what it looks like to image God. As followers of Christ, there's no greater way to reinforce our identity of being an imager than pursuing Christ. Because he is the image. He'll help you to remind you of your foundation, of who he's created you to be, but also help you to move forward living for God's glory. You got to look to Jesus as the example here. See, who determines your image? Are you tempted to forget that God has already announced that you were made in his image? Friends, I'm trying to encourage you this morning to look to Jesus because you've been divinely created and you are priceless in worth. This morning, the case has been made. You've been divinely created and you are priceless in worth. But where are we going to go from here? How are we going to respond to this? In 1997, MasterCard launched a classic marketing campaign. This campaign was launched to bolster the reputability of their credit card by sharing with their listeners that they do not have to miss out on the priceless moments of life. The first campaign commercial showed a father taking his son out to a sporting event and said, two tickets, $28, two hot dogs, two popcorns, two sodas, $18. Don't we wish it was that cost now? Come on now. All right. (laughs) Autographed baseball, $45. Real conversations, priceless. They always finish the commercials by saying, there are some things money can't buy, but for everything else, there's MasterCard. Some of y'all got, they got y'all at that. They're like, look, I need it. I need it. See, MasterCard seeks to communicate that no value can be placed on certain moments and experiences. And friends, God has made you with worth and dignity that is priceless as well. There's nothing that can devalue or diminish humanity as imagers of God. But God's already said you are priceless. There's nothing that can compare to you. Friends, we are priceless. Let me say this. The endowed worth bestowed upon us cannot be taken away from us. But that did not stop our rebellion from God. In the garden, Adam and Eve chose to be disobedient, and we too chose to be disobedient towards God. So even though we are priceless, our rebellion necessitated a high cost for our transgressions. 
So even though you're priceless, there was a cost. That cost came at Calvary. And brothers and sisters, the invaluable one, Jesus Christ had to come to pay an immeasurable sacrifice on behalf of those who are priceless, who bear his image. So it gets us to the cross. We look at Jesus because he's the only one that could pay the adequate debt for people like you and I. The invaluable one. The God man. He did that for us. He took on the wrath of God even though he didn't have to. But the redemption of his people were worth it. And his act of doing this helps us to experience redemption because God desires his people to fully reflect him to the best of their ability, to live for his glory, to seek to worship him. But it wasn't without a cost. The cost was Christ's shed blood. Friends, that's a case for you right now. You've been divinely created, and you're priceless in worth, and Christ going to the cross proved it for you. You didn't deserve it. You weren't worthy of it. Nothing that you've done yourself. None of your works, none of your good deeds, none of those things. But God in his love displayed it in his son. 